You might be thinking, why is this dingo playing Majora's Mask music for a Tears of the Kingdom review? Easy, because this is the last time I can confidently play that music knowing it is my favorite game in this series. Because there's a new boy in town, and he's a hot amputee. Enough of the cheesy dramatic intro. Hatana or Guda? Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom has been a monumental task to take on since its release. But as of this review, I have finally played through the whole game. It is truly one of the games I'd break the review scale for and give an 11 out of 10. Cause fuck the rules. The new game mechanics, the new open world, and the new story have been a treat and one I didn't really expect from a Zelda game. And I'm quite an entitled bitch with high expectations. I was still not ready for Tears of the Kingdom and I bought the frickin' limited edition OLED day one. As I recall, I certainly enjoyed my time with Breath of the Wild back in 2017, but it was missing the secret sauce that kept me from naming it one of the greatest of all time in my most humblest of dumb opinions. I'm stupid. As a sequel, tears came in and somehow annihilated my, and probably everyone else's, expectations. There will be some minor spoilers going forward, but I mean, come on, you've probably already been spoiled or seen the ending yourself if you found this review. The scale of what they've tackled is unlike anything I have ever seen before. So let's get into the rest of this review. One of the best things I think Tears of the Kingdom does is in its early hours, it starts you off with an antsy dancy little bit of story teaser. For someone like me who does like to play games with a good story, this was already a great start to the game and something other Zelda games haven't done as effectively. Getting that antsy little bit of narrative set the tone perfectly, which was a pretty dark tone and like I said, Majora's Mask was one of my favorites, so I was invested. You aren't just walking up and, oh look, that's a big man, elf world. <laughs> What I meant to say was, you aren't just waking up in a dark room and, oh look, that's a big world and an elf man. You are literally going right into the deep end, encountering the dried up evil raisin, Ganon himself. Once you get through that initial cutscene, you are shot into the sky into one of the better tutorial areas in a video game. You start getting your feet wet again, learning how to use some of the new tools, and meeting a goat. The Great Sky Island feels a little bit longer than the Plateau did in Breath of the Wild for me, but that was necessary as the abilities are a little bit more complex this time around. First you have Ultra Hand which allows you to grab things and attach things to other objects and create whatever your heart desires. The Fuse mechanic allows you to select a weapon or shield or an arrow and attach some weird things to it if you want. The Ascend ability, which I found that I didn't really use that much, that allows you to just kind of get to higher areas, but it's really critical for a lot of the dungeon moving forward. And finally, you have the Recall ability, which is every JoJo's fan's wet dream. They're really a fantastic suite of abilities, and you know, I love getting new glowy abilities with Japanese characters that allow you to control time. Manado, boy. Another thing that's great about Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is there's more than one way to complete a lot of these puzzles now. We're doing calculus now, not algebra. By the end, you're not even going to be an expert in what these new abilities have to offer anyways. The game expects that you have an interest in the systems as well as you're going to experiment like me. I made a car right off the bat. I expect we'll see some even crazier shit in the years to come when people have really paired into these new abilities. Tears of the Kingdom is just a very open experience, not in just the world, but in the mechanics. There's almost never one way to solve the problem. In fact, it's honestly hard to find someone who solved a puzzle in the exact same way as you. Every time I see someone post a puzzle solution, it's always different and people are discussing how they did it instead. The communal aspect of this game has been a treat for everyone, I think. 
and it feels like the whole gaming universe is trying to beat this game together. Once you reach some civilization, you're given a whole open world to play with. You got four choices. You got your bird boys, you got your women, you got your rock balls, and you got your talking fish. I think the things that make this world one of the best of all time is those new abilities and the shrines and puzzles that are around the world. They work so well together in a way I don't think any other game has done. I've even seen some talk about if games will take inspiration for this in the future, kind of like with Breath of the Wild. And I know some will definitely try, but it's taken of them about five to six years to make this game. And honestly, you can make arguments for even longer because you have to include the time for Breath of the Wild, which this game uses quite a bit of assets from there, but I don't think that's a problem at all. Breath of the Wild Walk, so Tears of the Kingdom, could build a giant flying mech and destroy our enjoyment of all future games to come. But when you're able to make a pickup truck with Ultra Hand, infuse a piece of meat onto a sword, and make Link a big meaty sword to fight yeah, with, boy. it's hard to argue that any other game has better puzzles and world traversal options. Which is another great boon to this game. You have so many options for just moving around in the world, which makes it some weird Grand Theft Auto Minecraft hybrid, and it's just so fun. The combat is not really better in terms of swinging our swords around and deflecting attacks, but your options with fusing weapons together is endless. If you had issues with weapon degradation in Breath of the Wild, this doesn't really fix it, but at the same time, I never really had an issue because I loved making those weird, wacky weapon fusions to handle all the different enemies in the game. And this brings us to the other multi-tiered thing that everyone's been talking about, and that's just the world itself. This time around, there are three main areas to the world, the main overworld, the sky islands, and of course, the depths. All three are filled with puzzles and collectibles and mysteries to solve. And personally, I would still say my favorite is probably that main overworld, as this is where still the majority of your time will take place and where most of the story happens. That doesn't mean I wasn't shooting myself into the sky and plummeting into deep, damp holes at every chance I got. But of my 80 hour journey, I would say over half of that time was really spent in the overworld. The whole layered cake of this game world is honestly almost too daunting of a task. There's quite a few returning villages and stables from Breath of the Wild where you'll find the majority of your side quests. To illustrate my enjoyment of the side quests, I'd kind of like to talk a little bit about my experience with Hatsuno Village and its little whole side quest mayor adventure quest thing. Here, you're trying to resolve an issue with these two characters that are kind of trying to become the mayor of Hateno Village and they don't agree on anything, or at least they think they don't agree. It's a quaint little story about a small village, but it's so intriguing to learn more about each of the two characters, especially given all the bad stuff happening around. And it's kind of one of those just really good side quests that takes you away from the rest of the experience, but is also adding to the depth of the world. I spent like three hours in Hateno Village getting all the gossip and solving all the mysteries of everything that was going on. In the end of that mayoral questline, you get a satisfying conclusion, and these are the kind of side adventures that are littered all around the game world, and I think they really add depth to this game, as they are displaying how this world is really turned on its side since dealing with the effects of the people. God damn it, why can't I say it? The effects of the upheaval that have really shattered this world after Ganon's reawakening. And if that wasn't enough, the sheer size of the world and all its content really intimidated me once I learned about the depths. While the overworld is where I spent the most of my time, the depths are what really intrigued me about this game once I got to that point. Now I will say upfront, the depths are personally not my favorite part about the game. It's really dark. It really feels so empty to me as well as so daunting of a task to complete, but I also do think it's one of the most interesting to discuss. I can't really think of anything else in Zelda that has had the feeling of a horror spooky game before in this extent.
Majora's Mask doesn't even come close to the amount of afraid I was walking around the depths with nothing and no light the very first time around. The depths really bring out the survival aspects of the game as well, as research management is critical. If you go down there unprepared, you can find yourself completely in the darkness, scared, alone, and calling for your mommy to come save you. It wasn't really until I made one of the hover bikes that I felt more comfortable taking on the depths. Since it's so dark and large, it's really hard to even take it on before that. But its inclusion is so critical to more than just collecting the fun costumes and zonai mining, but it's also very integral in the story of the game, which I will let you experience for yourself because again, it's a pretty crazy one for a Zelda game. But now I think it's time to shoot ourselves back up to the sky and go talk about some of the Sky Islands, which is an equally important part to this story. The sky is also home to some of the most magical moments of the game for me. Like when I first shot up into the sky and came face to face with one of the legendary dragons, as well as the first dive from the Great Sky Islands to the ground, those were just such amazing moments that are so unique to this game and I can't think of anything else that is honestly giving me that feeling of just adventure. It feels like a Ghibli movie or something come to life. While the Sky Island and stuff are a little bit more limited in terms of how much space there is to excavate, it is where several of the main temples are in your main goal for the story. I think these are the most intriguing part about the Sky World. The temples this time around are definitely more fun in my opinion, but I wouldn't say they compared to some of the better dungeons in the series. For the most part though, they involve getting to know the regional people, pairing up with one of the sages, and then solving an almost obstacle course like puzzle to get to that main temple. These obstacle courses are actually some of my favorite sections in the main story path. You are using a combination of your already current abilities along with the ability from the sage to get from one section to another. And once you get to that main temple, you are met with a more traditional style dungeon, but still a little bit of a hybrid from the Divine Beast, which usually has you solving a couple puzzles to unlock devices that release the main boss of the area. Only one left! These are similar to the controversial Divine Beasts, but something about their placement in the world feels more natural, and they do a good job of invoking a certain feeling. The Wind Temple makes me feel like an airship pirate taking over a ship. The Fire Temple makes me feel like a little dwarf infiltrating a mine. And the Lightning Temple makes me feel like a frickin' Indiana Jones hero. And finally, the Water Temple makes me feel like, I don't know, I'm in Mario Sunshine cleaning up all the goop. And at that point, I really kind of do wish I did have the flood to just clean up all the gross shit around. Regardless, getting through these are necessary, and they are a far cry from bad. But definitely not the most interesting part of the game. And the bosses, while they're a fun spectacle for the most part, I wouldn't say they're exactly the most challenging part of the game for me. But I think that leads us back to discussing the main story. So again, some minor story spoilers. So the story in Tears of the Kingdom is something I really enjoyed, and I think it really adds the cherry on top of the great mechanics of the world. Your main motivation is, of course, to find Princess Zelda and defeat Ganon. Not very original, but the main story is delivered through going around the world and talking to NPCs and just learning more about what's going on and how the new world has been affected. But the juicy shit is found to the tears littered around the world. One of the craziest parts about this experience to me was the fact that I didn't even find the first tier until like three temples into the game. But once I did, I was hooked on collecting all of them to get the full picture. These usually focus on what's been going on with Zelda while we're exploring the world on our own, as well as meeting some of the key characters from the past, such as Raru, everyone's favorite goat. These tiers usually range from cute little conversations with Zelda and other characters trying to solve the little issues of the world to emotional with a capital E scenes, the best of which made me tear up. The cutscenes 
make this the best version of Zelda in my opinion. It makes reaching her something you don't have to do because video game man save princess because she's cool, capable, and you can just see how much work she's doing to get back to the link and help save the world. And I can't help myself, I gotta talk a little bit about the ending, so spoilers. But the ending is such a chilling and magical buildup that is so worth it. Finally getting to Zelda has never felt so impactful, and that's probably from seeing her journey through the tears throughout the game. Regardless of the gameplay and everything else in the story, it's actually worth it for once, and told in a much more digestible and coherent format as opposed to a lot of the other games in this series. I never expected to see this level of story and emotion from a Zelda game, and I never thought I'd be so invested in the characters and the main story. But that really brings us to the end of this review in my experience with Tears of the Kingdom. This game has not only rocketed itself into first place as one of my favorite Zelda games of all time, it's also probably going to be my favorite game of 2023, but also potentially one of my favorite games of all freaking time. I'm still playing through the depths when I have some downtime and occasionally doing some of the shrines I missed through my main Zelda experience, but as of right now, I'm done with, you know, playing it for like five hours a day sitting on my couch or in front of my TV. If for some reason you made it through this and haven't played this game yet, which I kind of doubt because everyone's playing it, or haven't beaten it, I can say the journey in this game is 125% worth it. I personally cannot wait to see how Nintendo follows up with the next Zelda entry as well as just the next entries for the future mainline games that they put out in general because if this is the kind of quality we're getting from some of the Nintendo teams, I don't think I'm ready for what else is coming up in the pipeline. With that being said, if you made it to the end, thank you for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed Tears of the Kingdom. and. Like and subscribe if you would like more videos like this.